but gotcha. uh, where, where thanks so guys? much. I've, I've been. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm in Los Angeles right now. Have you? Uh, cool. I, I've seen how much you've toured. Have, are you familiar with Los Angeles? Yeah, I've, I lived there for like nine months. I'm trying to get back out there. I, I after tour last year, I ended up in Seattle, um, which isn't where I intended to be. I intended to head back to LA, but, um, but yeah, so I, I love LA. I've played out there many times and it's the best. <laughs> yeah, I mean, love it. I mean, it's no, no, no place is the same right now. So it's, uh, it's, it's hard. To, so you're not missing out on much right now, but, um, but yeah, come back here when, uh, when things get back to some semblance of normalcy. Yes, I will. I will head back. Certainly. So I, uh, I gotta say, I've been, um, listening to the stuff this week and loving it. I've been, uh, just in my car yesterday, jamming to uh, "Bomb Through the Breeze" for uh, <laughs> maybe the sixth, seventh time. I love that oh, one. Cool. It's a good one. Um, Thank you. So I, how uh, you know, I, I I read that you know you started embarking on your dream when you were eight years old. So what does that uh, is is that when you kind of started? Uh, is that how you got into music? Is that when you got into music? When you decided you were going to be a musician? Uh, how did you? How did your journey in music start? Uh, so eight years old was when I picked up guitar, but um, I started playing piano when I was three years old. My parents got me um, a piano. My brother, who's seven years older, um, plays music as well. And so it's always kind of been in the family. Um, my dad is a drummer who had like a rock band on Hilton Head. Um, I'm from Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. So there were, um, we were really lucky. There were a ton of opportunities to play music live in front of people. Uh, so I pretty much, you know, when I was three, I started playing piano and, and I did some classical competition kind of stuff. Um, but then it wasn't until I was eight years old and picked up the guitar and, and played out in front of like a live crowd for the first time that I was really hooked. Uh, so I've, I've been pursuing it pretty vigorously ever since it's eaten up any amount of personal time or focus that I've had. So. What were some of the the first things you were playing on piano? Uh, was it was it fun stuff or was it boring stuff or what what kind of made you start eyeing the guitar a little bit? You know, I kind of the the piano got a little bit boring to me silly silly. I don't know if that's a word mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> what, right. the classical yeah yeah we'll go with it um, the classical <laughs> yeah. side of things just kind of became. You know, I was reading music. I had started to be able to kind of sight read and my teachers were starting to get pretty hard on me uh, when it comes to learning all of the classical pieces. And I don't know if it was just that it was so structured feeling and that's what really drew me to guitar because piano, I, I my, my first real like passionate uh, stuff that I was playing on piano was the Beatles. My, my dad got me a Beatles Easy Play Today book. So I was playing the, the chords on my left hand and then basically playing the melody on my right. And that was my introduction to rock and roll. And I think that side of music really captivated my attention. And so um, the guitar was kind of the natural next step. My dad also played guitar. Um, that was kind of what he fiddled around on when he got home. So mm. I, I'm, a daddy's, I'm a daddy's girl. So it, that probably had something to do with it. Um, but I, as soon as I picked that up, you know, it was just the, the rock and roll energy for me flowed much, much easier on the guitar than it did on piano. Right. So you were already kind of playing some of, uh, some stuff similar on the, some of the, some of that bluesy piano stuff already though, with the, with the Beatles and, and kind of, and some of those simple chords on the piano was it, so you, were you doing that first on piano? Yeah, pretty much. I think I think before I really dived into the classical stuff heavily, the the you know the Twinkle Little Star phase, of course, was there and motor kicked on. Um, mm. And then I also, uh, you know, I, I I did the scales and the arpeggios, and I really did a lot of those basics, um, basic foundation work. Uh, and then the Beatles step came and then even when I started playing classical though the, the Beatles songs were what made playing piano fun for me were you already singing at that point along were you were you or or was that all instrumentation at that point still 
Yeah, I started singing immediately. I've I'd always been like a hummer and a, a singer and you know, I as soon as I got into grade school, I was getting in trouble for humming um, and singing. So I, I it was really natural to, to be playing piano and singing, which uh, I'm so happy that I just dived into. Because when I picked up guitar, it was kind of um, not a no brainer, but it was it wasn't a, necessarily a challenge. I was used to kind of doing the balancing act between the two. So I've, I've never I've never really been comfortable performing on stage without an instrument, you know, mm -hmm. um, and and kind of vice versa. You know, I, I don't really consider myself like just to sit back and play the rhythm guitar. You know, I'm, I'm always hankering to sing as well. So they kind of go hand in hand for me. Did you take uh, that formal training uh, that from your piano into your guitar playing? Like, are you when you're when you're playing guitar, when you first start playing guitar, were you looking at sheet music or were you approaching that more from a, a garage band kind of, um, you know, play by ear, looking up guitar tabs and that sort of thing? It was definitely way more of the guitar kind of nature. Um, I took lessons on guitar, uh, just like I had taken lessons on piano, but they had been more, not really theory based lessons. They were more based in, um, you know, I had my band from the time I was eight years old. So it'd be like if I needed help working on a song, uh, cause we were a classic rap cover band for the first handful of years. And so it was a lot of like just deciphering uh, songs and learning uh, finger picking patterns. That was, that's probably my favorite thing that I ever picked up from a teacher. Um, and it was, it was a pretty diversified uh, kind of range of stuff that I was doing there for, for a little while. But, um, but the classical side of things, I think, I think the, where that comes through is a little bit in my soloing, just in the fact of, um, and in my timing, I think. Sometimes I like to add, add bars in and I'm not always kind of sticking to like the four bar rule, you know, when you're in four, four and you're just kind of, doing things structured that way, I kind of throw in some weird, um, you know, like, oh, let's play this three times instead of four, you know, nothing too crazy. Um, but after playing with a lot of musicians, it's funny, there was a, this friend of mine, Sebastian Chang, he's a brilliant composer and piano player. And uh, we actually had him learn bass. <laughs> he learned how to play bass to come and sit on, in on a couple of um, shows we were playing over in Europe last year our bass player had to fly home and uh, he came in and he killed it and him and I in the jam sections because um, I very much like to, to open up every show and have a few moments in each show where we're all just kind of letting loose and it's a jam and nobody really knows what's going on and uh, when Sebastian and I were playing together um, it was it was really cool because I feel like he understood my foundation. So like any of like those weird things like he was playing off of as opposed to like working around. Um, and he's mm -hmm. very much based in the classical world. So that was really interesting for me. I think last year a light bulb went off where I was like, you know what? I don't think I've given the classical upbringing enough credit in my musicality. But clearly him and I were were on some of the same pages. So that was cool to find out. Yeah, that's, uh, so before, you know, at first I was, I was jamming your stuff and loved it. And, um, and before I, you know, I really took a closer look at uh, what you've been up to. I, um, I was just enjoying your music and I was thinking to myself, oh, this, you know, very cool singer, very cool music. Um, and I, and I hadn't seen any of your live stuff yet. And so I was like, oh, I wonder, uh, you know, I wonder what Hannah is doing in the band is if she's, you know, rocking the guitar as well as singing. And it turns out you're, hell yeah, you're rocking the guitar. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I, I, I saw your, uh, sound check at the Casbah. I grew up in San Diego, so the Casbah oh, was cool. one of my, one of my yeah. favorite old venues. Uh, yeah, so that was very cool just seeing you shred up there during your sound check. Um, so yeah, and I think, part. you know. <laughs> Yeah, I I, and I, I, would, I think, you know, the better you are at the guitar, whether you're playing rock or classical, it's going to start sounding more and more like classical. I was something I'd, I had a conversation with some friends a while ago. I know it was like, why is 80s metal like really, you know, 
crazy 80s metal sound kind of classical in its soloing and its progressions and i think it's because it's getting more and more complicated and closer the more complicated you get the more i think the closer you resemble classical music totally there's kind of uh this this distinction in my mind whenever i think of classical music where it's just like using as many notes as you can you know yeah, and like exactly, kind yeah. of with classical music is you're not playing in the pentatonic you know you're not sticking to those seven notes um or eight don't quote me on that one um <laughs> but it's uh it's definitely like when i when i was thinking of it when i was younger you know when i started to write um you know the the dumb rock songs which i love i love dumb rock songs which i'm thinking of like you know just the three chord maybe sure. doesn't ever change going from the verse to the chorus you know like those best, are pretty yeah. yeah those are the ones that you can really get your hooks into and then as i've gotten older you know it's almost it's just like a challenge it's like I I want to start working in different chords and different notes and all that stuff and I think I think like you said as things start getting more complicated that's how I've just now started to kind of be like oh yeah classical music was a part of my musical language at some point and um, it's actually triggered me I started playing piano again this past year um, really the last like year and a half but I uh, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to listen to, um, I did this EP that I put out earlier this year, but I did a, a piano version of Bomb Through the Breeze, um, which is actually heard quite, it, yeah. you've heard it. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that to me is like my, my most like classical-esque uh, kind of a thing. And I'm like, man, you know what? I really want to pursue that angle. It was really fun to recreate a rock song mm -hmm. into a, a classical arrangement. So she's thinking about doing that a little bit more. I think working that into my, you know, at least, if not just my daily routine as a human being and as a musician, um, you know, definitely kind of allowing the, allowing the, the more musical things to creep into my songwriting would be, would be pretty cool. Very, yeah, I mean, Led Zeppelin had some pretty, uh, you know, classical stuff going back to California with that, uh, I forgot what instrument that was, but it was, uh, was it is a mandolin? Um, it was, it was, I was just listening to that song the other day and it was, uh, it, it was just, it was awesome how, how classical some of their stuff sounded. Yeah, Zeppelin definitely is so unique in that manner. I think that has a lot to do with it. They're, they're, their rock is like transcendent, you know, it has like this like ethereal heavenly quality about it, you know, which probably is coming from the cues that you're picking up in the classical world. Yeah, totally. So I, um, how did you go from, you know, playing some piano and then, you know, picking up the guitar and, and, and shredding on that to going, you know, are you you're around 24 now, I think? And you've played 23, but I'm working towards 20, 24, 23. Okay. 23. Yeah. So it's been even more amazing. And somehow you have accomplished playing over 2,500 shows, which is crazy. So I think if you haven't already, you uh, put in the required, maybe 10,000 hours for, uh, <laughs> for uh, mastery. I, you're working on it, I guess. You're, you're yeah, working. the 10,000 hours. I, I honestly think that I have at this point, a lot of those shows were three and four hours each. So if you, there you go. do the math, I think, I think it'll have averaged out. But no, I mean, I, like I said earlier, I was really lucky to be from Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, which is just a tourist driven everything. So there's like, I think on a 12 mile island, like 300 restaurants or something crazy like that. So there was a ton of opportunity to, um, you know, play out at festivals and play to all the tourists and really cut my teeth in the live setting, which I'm so grateful for because there's a really big difference for me, at least between practicing at home or practicing in the bedroom or practicing, you know, with the band. Um, there's a big difference between that and playing live. Cause when you make mistakes live, you know, as a 10, 11 year old, I would like make a mistake and I would look over at my dad. My dad is a huge, huge reason why um, I am where I am. And he was my like sound guy and light guy and chauffeur and just, you know, dad extraordinaire. But I would always look over at him whenever I would make a mistake 
and he would catch every single mistake that I made. Uh, and so there was always <laughs> no question uh, on to what I should go home and practice. So I think playing live and getting that, um, not embarrassment, but because because when I was young, it was kind of, you know, the embarrassing and just like, you know, like, oh man, I don't want to do that again. Uh, and you also just get really good at, at kind of covering it up. I think that that's, that's one of the most important lessons to learn as a performing artist is how to, when something doesn't go your way or if something technologically is failing or anything, how to try and make it look as seamless as possible uh, and make everybody still feel like there's nothing going wrong. Um, I think that's, that's, what those 2,500 shows uh, have, have shown me the most. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I uh, took a couple music classes in my day and one uh, instructor told me, uh, especially with jazz and probably guitar soloing too, it's like, uh, as long as you play that note on time and with confidence, then it's the right note. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's almost worse to be off time, but with the right note, than be the wrong note and, and on, then, then, and off time. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the thing that I've heard similar to that, that I've always kind of stood by is if you make a mistake, if you play it three times, you meant to do it. And that's always come in handy for me. Ah, that's good. So that's that's a good one that's uh so just repeat <laughs> i i'll have to learn that one that's a good one just repeat it and then it's purposeful yep. exactly okay, that's so, that's when so you know. tell me uh, how did it how, how did it start so you you started playing some shows i assume the first few ones were, were smaller shows um how did how did things start to pick up steam Well, ultimately, I was uh, I was really 18 when the music business kind of scooped me up. Um, it was actually like the, my, my first ever music business meeting <laughs> came from uh, I was playing like a show at uh, the local bar on Hilton Head um, and one of Scooter Braun's fraternity brothers uh, sent him like texted him a video of us playing and the next day, Scooter Braun, um, you know, Justin Bieber's manager, uh, yeah. gave me a call and was like, hey, like, I want to meet with you. And I was like, this is so weird. Um, and I'd been like a classic rock person, not really into pop, you know, that whole kind of thing. So, um, but obviously I was, I was like, yeah, sure. You can fly me to LA. So that was my first experience was um, Scooter flying me to LA and, you know, we had a, a great meeting. He pushed my flight back, offered me like an artist development deal and like all these crazy things. And then, and then kind of nothing. Um, and I had, I had been really in a place of not, not willing to put my, um, put my name in front of things for a long time. The band had been the stepping stones and I had built that band with the idea in mind that you know, it'd be like a band, you know, and I never wanted sure. to be the, I never really wanted to use my face. I didn't want it to be all about me. And <laughs> mm -hmm. that was very much, that was very much part of the deal uh, out in LA, um, which makes sense in hindsight. Of course, I ended up doing it on my own anyways, but um, that was kind of the, the first brush with uh, the music business that I experienced. And through me wanting to really keep it the band and keep it going in that manner. Um, you know, I pretty much just kept my head down after that meeting and, and after things didn't really develop from there and just kept booking my own shows. And we started traveling further and further. And then like three months later, four months later, I got an agent from APA. Um, and pretty much we started growing my band more organically and just doing headline tours, um, we started opening up for some more like relic classic rock bands, uh, kind of like Kansas and Marshall Tucker and stuff. And then we started doing some cool things. Um, we opened up for St. Paul and the Broken Bones and all that really stemmed from, from you know, getting signed to that agent, um, to that agency. And, and that was really the, the initial progression of my career. So um, it's been just as up and down as as those beginning few months ever since. Um, but sure. it's really just been about growing and expanding and and 
you know, I played a lot of shows for free when I was younger. And sure. eventually when you just say yes to everything, um, the opportunities started to grow. So you sure. I, I saw that you played with uh, we've had them on the um, been lucky enough to have them on the podcast, the Jefferson Starship. That must have been pretty epic. <laughs> yeah, no, that was very cool. I used to ride the bus in the morning and listen to the this and I haven't been able to figure out it was like some compilation or like greatest hits um, of like a Jefferson Starship Starship slash airplane record and oh man they had some really funky trippy songs that I just loved as a kid um so that totally. one was really cool I was sitting on the, the side of that stage feeling pretty lucky at that point yeah and and you know since then you've uh you know been putting out uh, a lot of music and and so I, I guess uh some other crazy people you've been at least uh, opening for um or ex ambassadors cage the elephant tom petty alanis morissette mute those guys are muse i mean what was what which well, one have, was your favorite technically which one was your favorite part of uh technically technically those were all part of a festival um festival lineups which we've been fortunate enough to play um out in san diego um actually where you're from uh, yeah. We played the Cabo Del Mar Festival mm -hmm. back in 2017, which that was that's right. Two weeks before Tom Petty passed away, and we were on the same lineup. Oh. It was it was pretty much it was a really it was a really cool festival because they have a ton of amazing headliners, and they only mm -hmm. have three stages. So uh, mm -hmm. even if you're one of the smaller bands like we were, uh, you were got to play in front of a, a really killer crowd and and it was a pretty small lineup for being such heavy hitters. And um, Tom Petty's one of my, oh man, my family's biggest hero. Like if, if we all had like one mm -hmm. combined, you know, dude, we've seen him on, on tour many times as a family. And so that was really special because we, uh, you know, we played, we got off stage and then Alanis Morissette and then, Tom Petty and that was you know wow. the last time yeah. I ever got to see him play and it was actually the first time that I've ever cried uh because my parents were supposed to fly out to that show uh and and hang out and the year prior their house had been taken out by a hurricane in Hilton Head and then that's that next year uh when they were going to be coming out a second hurricane came and was basically flooding my parents at the time that Tom was on the stage and so he started playing you don't know how it feels to be me you know and i'm just i'm just like standing in the audience i'm like you're right tom nobody knows <laughs> and it was it was pretty it was pretty epic so that that has to be my favorite i actually named my puppy kabo after playing that festival with oh tom. nice well that yeah. is an epic that is a legendary moment to be moved by tom petty right before he he left us so lucky you yeah, and, I, and the play next to him. Hey, even the losers get lucky sometimes, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tom Petty quote right there. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, yeah, Kabo and uh, Firefly Music Festival, also another huge festival, uh, more on the East Coast. Um, mm -hmm. So probably another a whole other string of of huge artists there. So what you're playing these small shows, and then and then you you know you meet. Uh, scooter bronze friend and and then you you know develop some relationships and you get your agency and they start booking you for for these great uh these great shows um what am i missing that happened in between any any other stepping stones that happened from uh from <laughs> picking up that guitar and 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 then playing huge festivals all of a sudden you know i mean ultimately it was it was compounding work um mm -hmm. that that really got us there. I think we had a really good, um, we had a really great time recording. I recorded a record with Sadler Vaden, uh, who's Jason Isbell's guitar player um, over in Nashville. That was Bomb Through the Breeze. Uh, Sadler and I co-wrote that song together. So that great was a song, really yeah. important, very important stepping stone is, is that last record that I put together. Um, Cause I don't think any, a lot of this stuff would have come to fruition had the music not been there. So that, that record for me was, um, you know, 
a really important one. I think it was, it captured uh, a really funny time in my life. Um, I was going through my first breakup. I, I hadn't, mm-hmm. I hadn't really, I'd been so focused on my career my whole life that I hadn't really ever divulged too much in the romantic world. So, um, mm-hmm. so that record was very therapeutic for me coming out of, coming out of a breakup. And I think uh, as far as getting to where I am, it's, it's really one thing leading into the next and saying yes to a lot of things yeah yeah i mean for uh that song sounds like it would be therapeutic as a breakup song because it's not a woe is me it's kind of a you know it's kind of a like a rallying cry i feel like kind of like an empowering song so uh so i think that's that's the we need more of those types of breakup songs Definitely, definitely. I think uh, the, the, the song on, on that record that really rang true with the heartbreak notion was this song uh, called Strawberry Moon, which I named my label after. And um, one of the lines in the chorus is, uh, it's fine, I've got dreams to be thinking of, you know, and that's, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of like, you know, thanks for my intro to love, but I do have, I do have other things on my mind, so. Yeah, obviously. And uh, so what have you been doing? Um, you know, I, we've, we, we're talking to artists all the time. So it's uh, this year, particularly, I feel like uh, it's hard for probably any artist to not feel like if there was, you know, some momentum that, you know, all of a sudden it was put on pause. So what have you been doing in 2020? Have you been writing a lot? Is, is that what you've been up to right now? Is, is, is that kind of the MO for right now? Yeah, so I've been writing. I went into the studio to uh, to start tracking a record um, of songs that I've I've had for the last two years, pretty much. Um, the plan this year was to be touring pretty heavy in in spring, summer, and then uh, start the new record later this fall. So so we kind of continued on with that plan, and I've got um, you know new stuff in the works even past this new record. So it's a really good time for accumulating uh songs and you know kind of getting the direction but i've i've really been also taking it easy and you know i i've talked with a lot of my artist friends and i think we're all feeling mm-hmm. a somewhat of this a same thing of man having a break without the pressure of everybody else like you know putting out putting yeah. out putting out uh it's been really yeah. healthy i think for the soul i know that mm-hmm. i've I've been, like I said, I said yes to every show pretty much from the time I was eight years old that I, I had never taken any time off. Having a month without playing shows was pretty abnormal um, right. for me. And so it, it was kind of a forced break that um, I think is going to be really beneficial for me as a, as a human. Uh, the, the times yeah. have been pretty fucking stressful though i mean it's been a it's been a hell of a world to look at on the sidelines yeah Yeah, and i i was it's funny you say that because i was i was just gonna say if if anyone could use a break uh someone who is only 23 and has already played uh 2500 shows uh you know maybe that's good for you (laughs) maybe maybe that's a healthy break uh yeah my body my body is pretty happy with the break touring is not this is not uh, easy on the bones. <laughs> so maybe this is uh, you catching your breath right before you explode to even higher heights. But um, ah. but that said, uh, I think you uh, transitioned uh, to a to a uh, to a good segue to your new single, uh, which I think uh, I think certain times and certain leaders just inspire good punk rock. So uh, <laughs> I'm you, glad you uh, said punk rock. That's totally what I was going for with this song. I was just like, this is my punk song. Right, exactly. I mean, and I, I remember it was around three, four years ago, a friend of mine was like, well, at least punk rock might get good again. <laughs> you know, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so you came out, uh, new single, Psycho Babble. And um, basically, I think, uh, long story short, uh, you want to help get out the, the message to, uh, to vote. Correct? Certainly. I think that it is the most important message for everybody to be shouting from the rooftops right now. I think voting is, uh, man, we got to do it. I, I have had quite, um, quite an astounding vision of, of the last 
past four years that I'm I'm just I'm just horrified. You know, it's 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 there's only a little bit that we can really do to um, to exercise our our voices and voting is so important. I know that I, you know, I haven't always utilized it, you know, in the in-between elections and such. And and at this point, I want to get involved in the local government. I'm ready to be completely aware. You know, being a 23-year-old, I'm I'm I graduated high school when I was 16, but I I'm not that far out, you know. I still have those, you know, like close memories of high school and man they did not mm. teach us shit about our government and voting and taxes and any really of that don't. stuff yeah. it's it's pretty astounding to me um you know seeing all of the comments on facebook and such and just being like man our our country failed us as <laughs> the education system goes for sure yeah yeah, I've had those. I've had similar conversations recently. It's, it really is amazing that when you think about it, that we don't get taught how to do our taxes. We don't get we don't get taught how to add a register to vote. You know, basic basic life skills. I mean, I think they have those classes maybe as an elective, uh, but we should definitely make those uh, some general education courses for sure. Yep, it's 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 time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, good message. Um, so what we like to do at the end of our uh, discussions usually, and it was great talking to you, Hannah. It was really a pleasure. Um, I, like uh, I, see, I see big things for you. And I, um, I'm actually a little bummed. I, I don't know if it was my connection or yours or both, but uh, I, I would have had my camera on more, but uh, the connection's a little uh, funky today. But um, we like to ask our artists, uh, you know, if you uh, could give one piece of advice to aspiring artists, what would it be my one piece of advice would be to be very strong in your convictions and know your worth um i have a story that could go along i don't know if you want to hear it <laughs> yeah let's hear it let's hear it. i'm in no rush uh, good one you know i think as a as a young female and and i try not to have that be the center of of most of my talking points you know mm -hmm. um but being a young girl in the industry one of the first shows that i was playing with uh with my new agency it was the first show one of the first shows i had ever played that had a contract uh before the show um which mm -hmm. was a whole new world for me uh we were playing some bike rally up in in myrtle beach and okay. And we were opening up for the outlaws and we were supposed mm. to play on the really big stage um there's like one main stage and the production was just running a little bit behind and the guy who owns the place this like big burly dude was mm -hmm. like ah oh, yeah we're running behind we're gonna have you play the other main stage mm -hmm. and he walks me over to like the tiniest little stage floating on a lake hidden in yeah. the back corner of the property uh -huh. mm -hmm. and i called my agent and he was just like you know what you need no, you're supposed to, you're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed yeah. to be playing on that stage. And so I, mm -hmm. I like argued with this guy and for, for a while and had to be pretty, you know, not a cute young girl for a <laughs> while, um, mm -hmm. which really ruffled his feathers. And when we got done playing, uh, he came up and handed me like 400 extra dollars cash and was just like, Nice. thank you thank you for making sure that you played up there you know and we yeah. we played to a ton of people and like that that same instance those same similar things had happened to me at other points where i didn't you know push for myself and stand up mm -hmm. for myself because no one else was and um that made a huge difference and and that story kind of has was like the beginning of me entering into the business with that head on my shoulders. So I would just you say, probably, stand you up. Probably melt, yeah, you probably melted his face off and then he, <laughs> and then he felt dumb. Yeah, you know, I've had a few, I've had a few grumpy old men come over and apologize to me after I play. <laughs> it wasn't the first time, but yeah. So good on it's, him it's, for, uh, for recognizing and, and trying to make it right at the end, I guess. Totally, totally. It was it was a really valuable moment for me. It was a really good learning lesson for me. So I'm grateful that it happened that, that how it did. Um, but that would be my that would be my advice 
is to just, you know, go after it, be strong in your convictions and pursue what you love. Bring me the best word.